I think this is really cool. I think this is really neat. This is something that maybe you've seen before. Maybe you haven't. Chances are that many people haven't seen the Trinity spoken of in this kind of in this way. But I want to show you something. And we will look at some of the usual suspects. That is some of the usual passages that we might go to to talk about the Trinity and what is the Trinity. We talk about those little diagram that uh, who God is is. Uh, the Son is God, the Father is God, the Holy Spirit is God. And, you know, it says also that the Son is not the Father, the Father is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not, the, you know, that, that. Well, here's what I want to show you. And by the way, I do believe that. I do agree with that. And I also say that the most important thing that's necessary for salvation is that you believe that Jesus is God. According to John 8, 24, that unless you believe that he's the I am, that you will die your sins. I'm not going from that particular uh, direction. Even though we can go to John 1, the Bible says in John 1, all of you know this passage fairly well. You could probably just quote it off the top of your head in John 1, 1. It says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we have this predicate nominative that is God, and it describes what the subject, that is the Word, is. And so in this case, we know that the Word is God, was God, is God, and he was there from the very beginning. But what I want to look at, though, is I want to look at God from the standpoint that he is the father. And I want to look at Jesus from the standpoint that he is the son. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the son. As a matter of fact, let's just look at a couple of passages. And let's also look at the relationship between the father and the son. I think it's easy to understand, easy to know. It's not, it's not breaking news that the father loves the son. Now, the reason why that's important is because of who the father is. The Bible says that God is love. We'll come back to that in a second. But John 335 says uh, the father loves the son and has given all things into his hands. So the father loves the son. Also in John 520, for the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself is doing. And the father will show him greater works than these so that you will marvel. And so the father loves the son. It's not breaking news. Now, the question is, Jesus is, is the son. How long has he been the son? That's a good question. How long has Jesus been the son? God is the father. How long has God been the father? Well, the father loved the son. How long? We'll come back to that. But we need to understand that Jesus has always been the Son. Let's look at a couple of instances where we can see this. In Hebrews 1 2 says, In these last days he has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. So through who? Through the Son, Jesus made the world. That part is understood. And so it wasn't that he wasn't the Son when he made the world. He has always been the Son. As a matter of fact, we'll come back to Colossians 1 in a little bit, but or a couple of times we go to this, this verse. Before he he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Look what he says. Jesus, that is the son, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created, both the heavens and on the earth. And so it was the son who created all these things. Well, he's always been the son. If we go to Hebrews 1, 2, in these last days, uh, God has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed, his past tense, heir of all things, through whom also he, that is the son, made the world. So he's always been the son. He made the world. When he made the world, when he created the world, he was the son. And so it's interesting to, to note that. As a matter of fact, it's important to know that. You're going to see why, where I'm going with this in a second. But I also want to go to Galatians 4, 4. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, not to become son, but he was son. He sent forth his son, born of a woman under the law. So he's always been a son. So the question, Jesus is the son. How long has he been the son? He's been the son forever. God is the father. How long has he been the father? He's been the father forever, all throughout the eternity. The father loved the son before the earth was. Now, we know that the Bible says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So, too, it says about Jesus. He's the same as he's always been. Now, here's the question. Here's the statement. 
the Bible tells us that God is love. How long has he been love? Now, he could not be love if there were no one to love. And God could not be the father if there were no son. So maybe you can see where I'm going. He could not be love if there was no one to love. And so he's always had the son to love and he could not be the father if there were no son. He didn't become the father. It was not the point in time where he was not the father. And there wasn't a point in time where Jesus was not the son. And there wasn't a point in time where he had no one to love. Now, what I want to do, I want to read a quote from uh, Michael Reeves, who wrote the book Delighting in the Trinity. He says that there was never a time when he didn't exist. That is never a time where one, the father didn't exist, but also never a time where the son didn't exist. If there were then God is a completely different sort of being. So if there were a time where the father did not exist and there was a time that the son did not exist, then the father, God, is a completely different or sort of a being, meaning he was at some point in time not the father, at some point in time not loving. He is a loving father. And if there were once a time when the son didn't exist, then there was once a time when the father was not yet the father. Are you guys following? So he's always been the father. He's always been the son and he's always loved the son. Well, when, how long has he been loving the son? Let's go back to John 17. He says in verse 23, I in them and you in, I, in me and that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Now he's speaking of them kind of being in this, this unified sense. Remember when the Bible tells us that uh, when he makes man, he says that make them in our image according to our likeness. That point, the part where it says according to our likeness, image and likeness refers to form and function. The function portion, the likeness portion is how the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, how they are existing uh, united in a unified fashion. They are one. Are you guys with me? So therefore, when he makes this statement in John 17, he's really hearkening back to what he said in Genesis. And we know that because he says, give me back the glory when that I had with you before the world was. So piggybacking off of when the world was, verse 24 says, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me uh, be with me where I am so that they may see my glory, which you have given me. For, look what he says, for you love me before the foundation of the world. In other words, he's making it clear that the father has always loved the son. He didn't start loving the son, so therefore he's a loving father. How long has he been a loving father? He's been loving forever from eternity past. And who has, been, who has he been loving? He has been loving the son. Therefore, this loving relationship has always existed. Now, that's good in and of itself, but there's more to it. There's a reason why. The reason why it's important to know that and to know Jesus. Remember, God has revealed himself, one, in nature. The problem with that, though, is it doesn't tell us enough about salvation, enough about him. We just know that there is a creator. But he also has revealed himself in his son and then obviously his word. That's how we know about his son. But he's revealed himself in his son. And so the Bible tells us in, in Galatians 4, 4, that in the fullness of time that the son was sent. My, as a matter of fact, 1 Timothy tells us that he is the full, I'm sorry, he is the manifestation or the revealing of the father. And so that is important. But what does that mean? What does it have to do with the Trinity? And oh, by the way, there's an important point that we should lean on as exegetes. And it's where we get that from this relationship. That doesn't make any sense, huh? To say that we get our desires to be Bible readers or to be good exegetes from this relationship. I'm going to show you that in just a second. But we want to see this relationship. God wants to reveal, wants to show this relationship. What relationship? Well, this loving relationship. You know, the loving relationship that he's always had with the son. He's always loved the son. And he extends this love to us. Why am I saying these things? Well, first of all, the Bible says that greater love has no one than he laid down his life. This is Jesus. He says that the Bible tells that Jesus is the one or greater love that no one can have than lay down his life. But we know that this is what Jesus did for us. He lays down his life for us. But let's back up a little bit. Let's go back to John 1. Not John 1, 1, 
or John 1, 2, or, eight, or John 1, 3, or John 1, 4. Let's drop down a little bit further, and let's go to verse, man, let's start in verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father. So the Son who comes from the Father, full of grace and truth, John testified of him uh, and cried out, saying, This is he of whom I said, he who comes after me has a higher rank than I, because he existed before I did. For his fullness we have received, and grace upon grace. So now let's drop down to verse 18, and I want to show you a couple things. One, he says, no one has seen God any time, the only begotten God. Notice he calls him the only begotten God, this term monogenes theos, which is the same that's used in John 3, the, the monogenes, the only begotten son. But this case, he calls himself the only begotten, or he's called the only begotten father, or the only begotten God. That's not a typo. That's, that's there for a reason. Why? He says, who is in the bosom of the father? And look at this part here. He says, he has explained him. Who has explained him? Who has explained who? Well, the he is Jesus, you know, Jesus, the son, and he has explained him, the father. What does that mean? Well, I want you to look at this word here. The word for explain in English is the Greek word. This Greek word is exegesita. What does that word mean? Well, that's where we get our English word, that term that we talked about earlier, exegete. So when we say that we want to be good exegetes, we want to take out what the word says. We want to be able, be able to explain what the word is saying. So when we say we want to exegete the text, explain what the text is saying. Take from what it says out of the text and don't put in any more in it, but it's explaining the text. Well, look what the Bible says. The Bible in essence is saying that Jesus exegetes or the son exegetes the father. The son explains him. How does the son explain the father? Well, what is the father? He's a father. He's always been a father. And what kind of a father? He's a loving father. He's always been loving. And so what is Jesus doing? He's explaining that to us. He's sharing that with us. He's revealing that with us. Remember, greater love has no one than to lay down his life for a friend. And where do we get this from, this concept from? This concept starts off originally in Leviticus 17. We've covered this numerous times. And he says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. Well, again, we've covered this before. These, these Hebrew words that are underlined, this word right here is wa'ani and I. And then here we have natatin, which is I have given. We don't need this part here that's highlighted. We don't really need this part because all of this says I. This part here, we it already makes the statement I have given. So in Hebrew, the words by themselves can convey the pronoun. The pronoun doesn't need to be there. So this by itself without the ani can be taken away. How it's read, the rough way of kind of reading this is I, I have given. It's a weird way of putting it, but it makes perfect sense. As a matter of fact, it makes better sense because in this way, it's telling us that God is saying that I myself have given. No longer are we, am I going to have you to rely on the blood of bulls and goats? but I myself have given, which is why we've covered this before in Hebrews 10, 5. He says, sacrifice and offerings, you know, the blood of bulls and goats, you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me, meaning that the me has always been there. You know, Hebrews talking about the son, how we, how he speaks to us through the son now. And so he prepares a body for the son to do what? To offer up what he's saying in Leviticus 7 11. He's given his blood on the altar. And to make sure that we know that it's God who is giving the blood in Acts 20, 28, what does he say? Be on guard, speaking to the elders, be on guard for yourselves and for the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God. And here it is. This is the important point. This is the clincher. He says to shepherd the church of God, which he, God, the father, purchased with his own blood. How could he have done so? Well, because the son, um, Jesus, uh, is explaining himself or exegeting, as we said earlier, he's, he's showing the same sort of love that the father has for him. He's showing to us. 
So Jesus, who is God, has come to pay a debt. The Bible is saying that God, this is God's blood. We already know it's Jesus' blood. And so why is this important? Because here we see the whole point, the purpose of Jesus to show, to share, to explain, or as we said, to exegete, to make known the love of the Father. The Father has always loved the Son, and so now the Son can show to us, can make us, make it known to us how much he loved us by dying for us. And I think in this regard, this helps us to understand, even if we don't even quite figure out and still doesn't always make sense how God exists, uh, his deity, his his identification, how we, how we understand him. I get it. That could be confusing. But what couldn't be confusing, what should not be confusing is his purpose in our lives, what he is trying to do, what he came to do. And that should make us be even more appreciative because all throughout eternity, before there was a world, before there was us, he was loving the son. And so now the same love that he was having and showing on the son, he's showing that very same love to us. How cool is that?